Corey, I had a thought the other day. Do you want to know about it? I mean, you're going to tell me anyway, so let's hear it. Exactly. So the best part about Zaxby's is the plethora of options, the uh, the zappetizers, if you will. And mm-hmm. you're big on the mushrooms, but you also – you had us try – I think it's it's the fried white cheddar bites. Yep, it was good. Delightful. So – I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it started making me think. I'm like, it tastes so similar to something that I really liked as a child. It was like that tin canister blue with the yellow lid, and it was like the cheese balls, but it was like the crunchy sort of like foam orbs of deliciousness. It tastes, yeah. it tastes just like that, but this is even better because it's fried, and it's got that gooiness to it. I would say it's better than that. I don't want people to think that that's exactly what it tastes like because some people might not be um, that that might not be appealing to some. But yeah, no, it's it's really good, buddy. And if it reminds you of your childhood, what what else more can you ask for? I know Zaxby's indescribably good. Let's do a podcast from Tally to Cali. It's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What up, everybody? It's Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. I'm Aslan. Corey's here as well. If you could, please subscribe to this podcast, rate and review it on iTunes. A lot of folks, Corey, don't, you know, I think for some folks, podcasts, sound a little intimidating uh i know some people go on to war chant and listen to us straight from there some people go to podbean or SoundCloud. folks if you've got like a mobile device like a phone just download a podcast app uh you know on on the iphone there's the apple one if you have an android device i would say use google podcasts go on there search us search seminal headlines search murder mysteries whatever you like and then you just subscribe to it And then every single time a show is published, like ours, on a daily basis, most of the time, but I traveled the other day, it's automatically there on your phone. You can even set it to where it'll it'll automatically delete it after uh, you listen to it so it doesn't take up a bunch of space on your phone, and then it's right there. You don't have to worry about anything. So how do you usually, how do you digest your podcast, Corey, that you listen to? Because you're a big podcast guy because you're always on the road driving. Yeah, most of the time it's when I'm driving because I'm, I mean, it's, Usually, especially this time of the year, I'm in the car 10 to 15 hours a week. Uh, So, yeah, that's a lot of podcast listening, my man. Yeah, but what do you do? Like, do you have an app and then you just search for them on the app? Or do you, like, go to their website on your mobile device? Oh, no, I definitely go to the, I just do the uh, the iPhone app. Okay. All right. So, yeah, do that, folks. Get, get I'm not the, an animal. Yeah. It'll be there, waiting for you every single day. Uh, day one has come and gone for Florida State at IMG Academy. They'll be here for two more days. They'll be here Wednesday as you're listening to this, and Thursday they'll uh, they'll shut her down or whatever. So uh, start of the, uh, the podcast off with had a bad day, Corey. You can't win every day in preseason. It was one of the more discouraging days. Discouraging sounds a little too dramatic. It is one day after all. I don't want to get too much into it, but the limited time that we were out there to watch it, us as the media – There wasn't a lot to feel good about. It seems like pretty much every single segment I was around, something went wrong to to draw the ire of either the the coach running the segment or a player, a leader on that sort of side of the ball. And I don't know how much of that is just the fact that they got in a bus and drove like five hours to come down here and then wake up pretty early in the morning again and get out at practice and they're in a new place. They're not in their usual locker room. And I like the sort of I like the idea of training camp being on the road for like a like an NFL team. You open up to the to the fan base. It becomes like a parade, a festival almost. But you're still getting some some serious work done. You know, ultimately, I don't know how many people involved with this program will be too bummed out when this thing ends up, you know, running its course. Uh, but after one day, it seems that they probably would have got some better work in, in Tallahassee. Let me just kind of rattle off a couple things uh, so I'm not just uh, simply speculating, just things I saw. Several drops by the wide receivers against air, you know, not even one-on-one, just, just running routes against air and dropping the ball. Uh, there was a defensive lineman who I think a lot of people would consider a, a leader on that unit saying, as I, I could hear him yelling as I was on the other side of the field, so I started walking over there. 
And he said, quote, you can't walk in my shoes if you ain't going to buy in. you got to take your blank somewhere else. And then someone immediately said, yeah, yeah, let's buy in, y'all. And then Odell kind of calmed him down and brought everybody together and was like, all right, guys, we need to, we need to put in some work here. It's not, it's not just about doing work. It's about doing things right and, and learning. Uh, Mark Snyder was not particularly pleased with a certain player's effort during uh, one-on-one drills when they're going up against the uh, H-back tight ends. Uh, Dante Pippleton, very animated, very animated while he was criticizing one of the running backs after dropping a, a ball or not running the right route out of the backfield. And then the offensive line, they were practicing sort of uh, dummy counts, you know, dummy snap counts. And I saw the reserves go offsides or, or false start jump twice. And uh, Ira actually, and I was like, it's to the reserves, it's okay. And then Ira's like, actually, he's like, you know, before you got here, the first team jumped offsides, something like, or false started twice. And then one of the guys who actually was like, come on, y'all, let's get on it, actually ended up false starting the next uh, snap. So uh, I guess maybe that reminds me that this offensive line still has a ways to go. But again, it's just one day, it's 25 minutes, and they're in foreign territory practicing at a place that they don't call home. Yeah, um, and what what is it that like uh, you, you saw probably twelve percent of practice or thirteen percent of practice probably they they had plenty yeah. of chance after after you guys left to pick it up. I'm not saying they did. It well, might have just been a bad bad practice, or it could have just been a bad start to a practice. Also, also sorry not to jump in so quick after I talked for five minutes there, but practice did. At, I don't know if that if if they reconvened, but they had to get off the field due to weather, so uh, they didn't probably make it more than forty five minutes before they had to oh. clear the field because of weather. And I don't know, as we record this podcast, uh, I don't know if they ever return to the field on Tuesday to finish up the practice. So, But, yeah, I mean, it might have been a good thing maybe just to get off the field that day and just kind of clear their mind and come back at it strong on Wednesday. Or maybe they got back on the field later on Tuesday and, and went after it really hard. But, well, they yeah. better have. I mean, there, 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 had to be an hour, there, there had to have been an hour window somewhere in there where it wasn't a downpour yeah. um, or lightning. You spending a lot of money to go down there for three days go go practice yeah. um yeah that they don't they don't need it they just had a day off they don't need another day off so yeah i mean some of that you know it's the start of a new week it is after a day off it's in a new city you you can understand why they be they're you know they're young there's a there's a reason to be a little rusty you just hope it wasn't going to last the whole practice so I, I and that always happens the 2013 team you know there were at least two times where jimbo came out and just wanting to punch someone because he was so mad about the way they practice in the preseason and that ended up okay so again i'm not quite i'm not i'm not going to compare not yet i'm not going to compare the 2019 team to the 13 team yet i gotta see some more things first go ahead man it's fine no no i gotta see some things first but um yeah i mean i I think every football team alabama georgia the new england patriots they're always going to have moments like that where it just it, it feels like it's kind of spiraling good teams are able to you know uh Right the ship, as I like to say. Yeah, my concern wasn't. It was just the fact that it just it it seemed like everything. Maybe that's easily explained away when everybody's having an off day, right? It's it's the travel, it's being somewhere new, it's all that sort of stuff. As opposed to just one sort of segment of the the team having a a bad day might be kind of a weird thing. So it's because everybody trying to get on the same page. I do ultimately wonder you know, what they get out of this experience. You know, a lot of it, this goes back to the whole ethos of Willie's coaching style where, again, I don't think it's a dog whistle when people say he's not an X's and O's coach. I do think he's so much, he's so he's such a big believer in the intrinsic value of teamwork and camaraderie and how important that is into the mix of being a successful football team. And, you know, maybe them having a rough 30 minutes at a practice is worth it because, you know, they've spent, they're going to spend 10 hours on a bus over the next three days. They're staying in those nice, posh apartments, I think, on campus there at IMG Academy. So you grow, you learn about one another, and, and there's a value in that more so than, than, than being in your own dorm or whatever. But I do ultimately wonder what they're getting at, because a lot of it people talk about the recruiting aspect, but it's the dead period. Uh, these players can't really interact with the coaching staff. It's nothing that's open to the to the public to, to drum up local support or you know try to reach out to a, a different segment of your fan base, but I mean ultimately it, it it's a, it sounded like a, a cool experiment and that's what it kind of is. It seems like you know they'll do it for this this season here and that'll that'll run its course. 
Um, but somebody pointed out it, it was kind of ironic that, you know, they, they, they spent all this money, built this IPF, and then they leave it to come down somewhere where there isn't an IPF. I thought that was funny. But ultimately, they'll have two more days to, to get it back on track. And, and I think they will, Corey, because overall, otherwise, it's been an encouraging camp. There's been a lot of sort of growth you've seen, a lot of uh, new things, a lot of uh, positive signs, including if you look at our video, even you, Corey, as the audio starts getting a little weird on me here, it's getting persnickety in this hotel room. Nice hotel, though, Corey. Much better than last Good. year's accommodations. Look at the 620 well, mark of the video, everybody at home, and you can, you can too later, Corey. Uh, they've got some wrinkles they're working on, Corey. So they had, two, they had two backs in the backfield with the quarterback flanked on each side, and basically – Hornybrook hands it off because it was just Hornybrook on the on the rep. Actually, it was James Blackman. I take it back. James Blackman hands it off to Cam, and Cam's got Kalen to his right. Kalen starts running to his right, and trailing behind him is Cam. Kalen puts the brakes on, and then Cam flips the ball to him. Basically, the handoff goes to Cam, and then Cam can either option flip it back to Kalen, or he can keep it himself. So they're they're trying some things, Corey. It's crazy with this talent. Remember how deep and low this backfield was we thought last season and about all the yards they were going to get and all the lack of creativity they deployed in trying to figure this thing out. They're doing stuff. They're doing stuff, Corey. So there, there are things to feel good about. Check out the 620 mark of the raw video that's posted on Warchant.com right now. Do I have to do that right now or can I wait? No, I was telling the people at home. It's Again, I'm, just, I'm trying to lift the spirits. I'm trying to temper the enthusiasm. I don't want everybody to be like, oh, that one's being negative, blah, blah, blah. Give me a little bit of optimism, a little bit of hope. Those two guys look good. They look good, man. Those two guys are two really good running backs, really good athletes. Yeah, we're not uh, we're not exactly down on Anthony Grant either. Yeah. yeah. You know, he doesn't get talked about much because he's third string and he's behind those two guys. Um, and, you know, kalen has got the whole coming off the knee injury, and so that's a storyline. And then Cam Akers, it's last year most likely, and is he going to have another big year, um, uh, you know, more – aligned with his freshman season. So Anthony Grant's kind of lost in the shuffle, but I think that guy can play a little bit too. Um, so, yeah, man, I mean, hey, I, again, I have no doubt that if the offensive line is even serviceable, which we think it hopefully will be because of Randy Clements, that Kendall Browse isn't going to figure out a way to get the ball in his best player's hands and score points. Just that's what he does. A couple of other practice observations before we'll, we'll let Corey uncork it and just, you know, carry the show as he usually does. So they did something besides Oklahoma Corps. They didn't do like the one-on-one. -on -one. They didn't do null drill. They did a four-on-four -four exercise where they had three linemen. Usually it was like two off. Sometimes it was three offensive linemen. Sometimes it was two offensive linemen and a tight end. But basically three offensive linemen versus three defensive linemen. And then you had a handoff going to a running back and there was a linebacker. Uh, the defense won most all of those. And the thing is, as I was watching it, I was like – as, as if this opening period could not be more useless. I'm not a fan of the null drill, in case people haven't picked up on that. I'm like, th they just found another way to really just even, uh, you know, shoot themselves in the foot even worse when it comes to using this first five minutes of practice. But as it sort of progressed along, I'm like, well, this actually makes a little bit more sense. I, I, I actually was a believer, and I thought they got some good work done on it. But mainly the defense won the day on that. Anthony Grant, to your point was the one guy who seemed to have got a positive reaction out of the offensive coaching staff. I think ultimately it, it was one of those short yardage sort of mentality situation plays because it was three offensive linemen, three defensive linemen. They pretty much are you know taking each other up. And then it was like, can you, can you get past the linebacker or at least advance the ball? Because Anthony Grant didn't you know bust off 30 yards down the field. It was simply attacking the line of scrimmage, and then putting your shoulder into the linebacker and getting upfield a little bit. And that sent the entire offensive staff into a, a pretty nice uproar. So they, they ended that drill off with, with a nice note. So they are mixing in some, uh, some new looks. Uh, did see a very nice throw from Jordan Travis to Demarcus Adams. We'll talk about Jordan here in a moment. Uh, Keyshawn Helton had a really nice catch. He had to climb the ladder and go grab it uh, and got big kudos from the coaching staff. Warren Thompson was back out there, did not have the blue non-contact jersey he'd missed a couple practices with a concussion. So that was a really cool thing to see him back there. Uh, Ryan Roberts, our guy from uh, from up north, str still struggling with the heat, missed a couple of reps of the offensive line as he was trying to get acclimated to the weather going on down there. Um, but back to Jordan Travis, really nice throw to Marcus Adams. I know a lot of people are excited about 
Jordan and, and a lot of people have been asking about his status and, and wanting us to ask Willie and I've been kind of rolling my eyes about it. I'm like, man, he's, he's going to be the third string quarterback. Like, chill out, everybody. Um, I, I do wonder if there's any point in the season where maybe he is the primary backup. He he continues to look better every single time we see him at practice. And I don't know if he's got the same velocity as James Blackman. I don't think he does. But I remember those first few practices in the spring and thinking, okay, well, this is probably why Louisville – you know, didn't stand in front of the door when he wanted to leave. But he had a really good spring game, and, and he seems to be putting together nice practice after nice practice, getting nice kudos from the coaching staff and stuff. So th- this could be one of those things where we, you know, roll our eyes when Willie's like, hey, I got a plan. Relax when it comes to quarterback. I got a plan. You know, maybe he, he'll end up being a, a solid contributor and maybe spot duty guy for another season or two and eventually being a starting quarterback. But he got his waiver approved. Finally, on when did we find that out? Was it on Sunday or was it on Monday, Corey? Monday, buddy. Monday. Monday. So we found out on Monday. We were able to speak to him and Willie on Tuesday. Uh, you wrote a nice little story, kind of uh, summing everything up with some quotes from James and uh, Willie Taggart and Jordan Travis. He's he's going to be a he's going to be a definitely. A, I don't want to say insurance policy. That feels like you're really selling a guy short. Jordan Travis is a good football player, and he's going to be eligible immediately for Florida State. That's a win. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, there's no there there's no guarantee that he's going to play a snap. But in this, you know, most college football teams don't have three quarterbacks anymore, three legitimate Division one quarterbacks, and Florida State does now. Jordan Travis is, I would say, you'd put him in the middle between Hornybrook and Blackman as far as arm strength, and he's faster than both of them. Like he's a better runner than both of them. That doesn't mean he's going to, you know ever start a game it doesn't mean he's gonna ever start a game here period much less this season but yeah man I, I think an insurance policy is a great way to to describe him for this year he's a redshirt freshman and he's behind two guys that have started full seasons in college football so nobody's expecting him to win the job but things happen uh you know who knows who knows that whoever loses the quarterback job is still on the team in september you know what i mean in this day and age you can't count on that you know, and so you need you need three guys if you can get them. And so who knows? Who knows if Hornybrook hears he's not the starter? He's like, you know what? I'm bouncing to University of Green Bay or something. Um, or Blackman's like, no, I'm, I'm not staying here anymore. I, I don't foresee that happening, but you never know. Now you have a, a kid that's eligible that's pretty good. You know, again, he's not he's not sensational. He's not going to wow you with anything that he does. But like you said, he had a good spring game. Um, he seems like a great kid. He comes from great stock because, again, Devin Travis is like the nicest person that's ever gone to Florida State University, um, and that's his brother. So, you know, it certainly doesn't hurt. There's no there's no harm in having him eligible for 2019. I don't foresee it having a huge impact on the actual season, but just for a peace of mind and for death purposes, yeah, man, that's a good thing to have. And And moving forward, he's got four years to play for. So again, I don't think, and I, the thing about him is he's not the kind of kid, and this isn't a shot at him, but he's not the kind of kid that's going to scare away quarterback recruits. But he is the kind of kid that they're going to have to come in and beat. They're going to have to compete with him. They, I don't think a, a true freshman is going to be able to come in in 2021, say, and just say, "All right, well, I'm definitely beating out Jordan Travis for backup to Jeff Sims, or I'm going to be the I'm going to be the starting quarterback." This kid will make them work for it. Um, even if he ends up just being a program quarterback and not necessarily ever being a starter. I sort of think that, that makes sense. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure, Corey. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, because, again, I was just thinking about how, because every single day people are asking about it, and, and once we posted the news on War Chan, it, it became like a four-page thread. I'm like, good grief. Like, everyone's this, this excited about a third-string quarterback. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see him. You know, he'll, he'll push Alex, and Alex is pushing James. They're all pushing one another. But, I mean, just think about, and, and people might want to laugh at this, but just think about the Peach Bowl, you know, whatever, three, four years ago. You know, Everett Golson was a starting quarterback going to that season, and then he checks out on the team. Sean McGuire starts that game and starts most of uh, the, the last three, four games of that year. But he gets hurt. J.J. Costantino has to come in, and obviously the offense doesn't move. There, there could be a situation where a guy like James goes down or, say, Alex gets a, a concussion filling in for him. I mean, what's to say that doesn't happen? And then you find yourself having to play a third-string quarterback. Well, the fact that he's immediately eligible, he becomes an option. And I, I think, you know, especially when you're talking everything is relative in this life, I mean, you talk about a third-string quarterback, There's you, you can't do a lot better, I want to think, than a guy like Jordan Travis, uh, judging by what he's done so far. And, 
it seems he got his, you talk about the good stock he comes from I and mean, just a, a really you know got his head on right you know talk the first thing he wanted to thank was the people in compliance at FSU uh, for helping him get the, uh, the the waiver and everything he talked about this is obviously his dream school so uh, Willie's talked about guys that want to be there that's a kid who wants to be there here there wherever you want to say so that that's uh it's, it's a shot in the arm man definitely a good thing that he's back. If, he's and, you know, remember last year, I don't know. I imagine maybe uh, Clemson still makes it, but the way the ACC is perceived, if their third string quarterback didn't come in and win that game against, was it Syracuse? Yeah. Yeah. When uh, Kelly Bryant bailed that yep. week and uh, Trevor Lawrence gets hurt. And then all of a sudden they're left with a third string quarterback. Now, if that had been a walk on a kid that just was, uh, you know, there for the scout team, Clemson loses that game. And we don't know if they ever if they make the national championship game. They, we don't even know if they make the playoffs because if they would have been eleven and one or whatever, and they'd have won the quote unquote uh, terrible ACC. So, you know, f- you know, th- having a third string quarterback can come in handy. By the way, are we ever going to get Kelly Bryant that championship ring? What? Well, let's talk. Can we talk about that for ten minutes? I want to talk about it for at least two minutes. Hold on, thought. Let's take a quick break. Second half of the show is brought to you by Birch Orthodontics. For nearly 20 years, Birch Orthodontics has been providing world-class orthodontic care right here in Tallahassee. And they've been doing it with the kind of down-home customer service that keeps all of their clients smiling. Whether you or your loved one needs braces or Invisalign treatments, Dr. Heather Birch and her staff are trained in all of the latest techniques. And the best part is they'll include you in every step of the decision-making process. They'll work with you to craft the perfect treatment plan and payment options to suit your needs. So if you're looking for family-friendly orthodontic care in a comfortable, stress-free environment, Birch Orthodontics isn't just your best choice, it's your only choice. Visit www.birchorthodontics.com. That's B-U-R-C-H orthodontics.com for more information and to set up your free consultation today. Or you can call the office directly at 850-877-1692. 850-877-1692. Apparently, and listen, I'm I'm so guilty of it, and it's it's a terrible thing, and I need to get better at it. I read headlines a lot, and I don't read the actual stories unless it's published by Irish O'Fell or Corey Clark on the byline. Mark. But but apparently, so this whole thing, if you guys don't know, and, and ladies listening to this, uh, Kelly Bryant is not is it, ha, did not get a championship ring from this national title that Clemson just won. And it's been a, a talk of a lot of, I mean, Feinbaum was talking about it. Feinbaum used it as a way to talk about how he doesn't like Dabo Sweeney, and he used to, but people change, and he thinks that, you know, with this big mega contract and everybody telling him how good he is, Dabo's changed. Crazy. But apparently, like, Kelly Bryant didn't even want a ring. This, like, I thought this was like Kelly Bryant, the, the way it's been framed, it's like Kelly Bryant got slighted, or Kelly Bryant maybe tweeted, or his feelings are hurt that he didn't get a championship ring, but apparently Kelly Bryant never made a fuss about this. So, like, why are we talking about it? And not we, you and I, but the, the royal we, as you say. I think he brought it up initially. Oh, did he? But okay. didn't say one way or the other, hey, man, I feel this is a this is a travesty. Give me my ring. We, want, we beat Texas A&M because of me. But at the end of the day, he decided he didn't want to play on that team anymore. They almost lost a game that cost them a national title. Like, he literally wasn't on the field. He was still in the – he might have been in his dorm room watching the game. Because it was literally four days after he just quit. Well, apparently without telling anyone that he was going to quit, they they sent coaches to his house, and he's like, no, after he lost the job. Um, that You know, and, and I just was like, man, I don't feel bad for that kid. He, he You know, he almost cost them a national championship by not being on. If that kid doesn't have the great fourth down throw in that drive at the end of the game, I can't remember his name. I want to say Chase something, no. the Clemson quarterback. I can't remember. I'll look it up. I'll look it up. So, yeah, so it's like, and he's on recruiting visits while his former teammates are out winning games every Saturday. It's like, man, I don't, you know, I, I think if he had, obviously, obviously if he'd gotten injured, if he, I, I think if, obviously, if he had left in, if he had uh, transferred, even in between, like, the ACC championship game and the national championship game, if he had transferred or transferred right after that, he definitely gets a ring. Uh, but you know what? Jacob Coker stuck around, man. He knew he was leaving. He still stuck around that season in 2013 i don't know and i but i wouldn't have a problem either way honestly give him a ring who cares really who cares uh i just think that it's different than the normal circumstances of people getting rings because he legit quit on his you know i in my opinion he quit on his team because he was like oh you need a second string quarterback in case trevor gets hurt against syracuse sorry use the guy that never plays i'm gonna be in my dorm room watching it or i might be on a recruiting trip 
Now where's my ring? And at the same, I get it because he was a senior and he wanted his last, he didn't want to spend his last year, his last eight games on the bench. But what what's he good? I don't know. I don't know. I look at it pragmatically. I don't look at it from his point of view necessarily. I I readily admit that. But wouldn't Kelly Bryant feel better about coming in and beating Syracuse and leading them to a win, a much needed win, and being on that national championship team and being a big part of it? Because he he started their first four games. They don't beat A and M if he doesn't play. Right. Like he would have been the reason they beat A and M, and he would have been the reason they beat Syracuse. He'd have been the reason they were in the championship game. And you know he would have deserved that ring. He he still maybe he probably does deserve a ring just for what he did against Syracuse. But then don't bail on your team against A and M. You mean what he did against A and M? He deserves a ring for that. What you mean he deserves a ring for what he did against A and M? Yeah, but I'm saying he would have also deserved it if he had stayed and done that against Syracuse. Right. Okay. But I get it because he you know da- the thing that bothers me though is Dabo even did it saying, look, we've only played you four games. You can still redshirt and take a year. So you can you can we'll only use you in an emergency. They had that conversation, and that still wasn't good enough for uh, Kelly Bryant. But oh, but my point was, what's he going to accomplish this year at Missouri? That's going to be anywhere close to as meaningful as what he would have helped Clemson do last year. It, hey, Gators. unless he goes out and wins the Heisman, beats the Gators. But the kid's not an NFL quarterback. He's not good at all. Uh, it anyway, was, it was Chase Bryce, the great Chase Bryce. There we go. In. I was close. I got it. I kept wanting to call him Chase Bryant. And I'm like, well, there's no way that's true. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, do what you got. to. And here's the thing. He's allowed to do what he did. Look out for yourself. Look out for number one. Nobody else will. That's fine. We get it. But, but then, yeah. you know, does he get does he get the swag from the from the Sugar Bowl, too? Like, you know what I mean? Like, did he earn that? Like, you know, I just be, be go have go in your career somewhere else and go play, it doesn't mean you get to come back for the team party. This also kind of makes me think about 2001, I think the the Patriots' first Super Bowl. So Brady takes uh, Drew Bledsoe's job, obviously. But then Brady got injured against Pittsburgh in the AFC Championship game. And I yeah. want to say it was actually in Pittsburgh. But yeah, so Drew Bledsoe either yeah, he comes into that game and helps lead New England to the Super Bowl. And uh and then he left. You know, he 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 was mad that he lost the job. He was really salty. There's great locker room video of him being interviewed and, and pretty much saying, like, yeah, you know, I'm healthy. I want, you know, my job. I'm ready to take my job back. And, you know, Bill Belichick was like, hey, chill out with that. But yeah, I mean, you know, he he, he sat there and, and held the clipboard for some guy named Tom Brady. And then went to the Buffalo Bills and quickly flamed out. Yeah, just finish out the drill, man. But, hey, to your point, he's got one more year to play football. Either he could have held a clipboard for, you know, a year or he can go out there and in front of some of the greatest fans in college football in Columbia, Missouri, and play some football, Corey. They love their football in Mizzou. They do. Speaking of which, um, it's list season. I just saw this on the Twitter machine. Sports Illustrated with their top ten college football Greatest college towns. Greatest college towns. Yes. Think Tallahassee's on there? No. Is Athens? Damn right it is. Is it number one? Number two. Oh, close. All right. Number two. 80 bars in a single square mile. Athens has more bars per capita than any other city in the United States, according to this article from Sports Illustrated. That sounds right, and it was like that. I remember them saying that uh, at orientation, which my mom was a real fan to hear. And um, but also the downtown is literally across the street from campus, mm-hmm. like right there, like where the arches are that you walk through, right across the other side of the street. That's where downtown starts. So um, that's you know that's that's what makes it so appealing, buddy. Yeah, well, College Avenue runs through downtown, and then obviously stops at the beautiful Westcott building and the fountains and everything. I do wish they had some sort of gateway or some sort of development that kind of would link the campus to downtown because it is it's within walking distance really when you when you boil down to it. Columbia, Missouri's on the list, Corey. Number five. So Clemson's not on this list. So Kelly Bryant gets a kick it at the number five uh, greatest college town. Number ten is Charlottesville, UVA. Number nine, uh, the city that Jimbo built, College Station, Texas. Right. Knoxville is eight, Oxford seven, Boulder six, Columbia number five, obviously, Ann Arbor four. Like, come on, really? Austin three, Athens two. Number one, Madtown, Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, all right. You know that's where Otis Redding died. 
Okay. Plane crashed. I saw the I saw the wreckage in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I remember you mentioning. I was going to say, uh, what's funny? Just taking it back to because you mentioned Kelly Bryant again. Like I'm understand, folks. I'm I'm the kind of person that like I remember when Jacob Coker was. So he had I think he committed to Alabama like in I don't know January of 2014, but he didn't graduate early. So he was still on. He was still a part of the Florida State program from like January until he graduated in May. I don't remember if he went through spring practice or not because I think he might have been hurt. But I know he had committed to Alabama somewhere along the lines when he was still at school at Florida State. And I remember asking Jimbo, like, like does he still eat with the team? Does he still use the weight room? Yeah. And Jimbo looked at me like, well, yeah, man, what? And it was just in my mind, I'm like, well, you know what? If he's not a part of your football team, kick rocks. Why does he get? Why does he get to lift weights? Why does he get to get stronger and better so he can go quarterback another team? When he's going to be the he could be the quarterback here if he'd just be patient. He'd be the quarterback here in 2015. So anyway, that's that's my mindset. That's where I come from when it co- comes to the whole Kelly Bryant team, uh, the whole Kelly Bryant uh, situation. You know, did they did Sports Illustrated do the top 25 programs of all time too? Was that them? Maybe I don't have it here. Um, I can pull up maybe on my phone. I don't want to pull up my computer because it's getting a little uh, froggy here uh, as we're recording our podcast. Wake Up War Champ presented by Zaxby's top twenty-five college programs, college football programs. Yeah, I just saw it on Twitter um, a couple for for the last couple of days, and it um, the list that they oh, went with we incorporated we like all one hundred fifty years of college football history. I see it throughout the one hundred fifty year history. Here we go. There's ten of them. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah, we're not. Oh. Do we want to talk about this? Well, it's uh, everybody's gonna get upset. Okay. Well, the whole Florida State's whole not on it. Everybody. Florida State's not on it. One hundred fifty years. Right, but I mean Tennessee's on this list. Yeah, that's the only one I take umbrage with. So the list, everybody, if you don't know, and we will wrap up the show after this probably. Oklahoma's ten. I don't have a problem with that. Tennessee at number nine, I have a problem with that. Penn State at eight, I don't know, man. I kind of have a problem with that, too. Nebraska, seven, I don't. Notre Dame, number six, I do not. Southern Cal, number five, I guess no, no, I don't, you know. Texas, four, Michigan, three, Ohio State, two, Alabama, one. Man, if Ohio State would have never hired Jim Trestle, I think Ohio State would have just faded into oblivion. But I don't he, know what that because it's such a big school and it's such it's so uh, football crazed. They would have gotten it right eventually. I, guess. Um, I think I, I personally think they would have gotten it right eventually. But yeah, you know, um, Jim Trestle really helped. I just but Florida State had the a run. problem with that. Um, is again, and and I saw people posting this on Twitter, so I'm not the only one that has this sentiment. But I'm not. I don't care what you did pre-integration. I just don't. It doesn't matter to me. Before 1970, it just really doesn't matter to me. So that that's not that that's not this sport. This sport that we cover today isn't. It wasn't. It wasn't this. So I don't care that Oklahoma had a 47 game winning streak in the 40s. Great man, congratulations. That's not what today is. So I, I just don't – I mean, Navy and Army were awesome. Holy Cross was competing for national titles. None of that should matter in the current landscape of uh, when you're when you're really judging the best football. Now, Alabama, no, we, who nobody has a problem with that, but they also claim like seven national championships just because they want to claim them. Yeah. So, but again, you know, they're, they've done pretty pretty well here lately. But I did have a, another one. So a guy at ESPN – I think he's at ESPN. Hold on just a second because, well, yeah. Here's my question. Um, can I pose a question, or are you ready to go with your thought? Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's well, Here's hear my thing. So, like, Florida State's run there from 87 to 2000 was is pretty unprecedented. I mean, I think Alabama's close to reaching that sort of status. And I know it's 150 years. But doesn't the fact that you've had such a run of unparalleled success, even if it is for a snapshot of time, you know, whatever that is, 14 years, and in a 150-year sport – the fact that you've only been around playing football for not even 70 years, like shouldn't that give you more points than like Penn State? Like what what was what was Penn State's the Penn State go on a crazy 14-year run? I don't think so. I don't think Tennessee did. 
But then again, they've been around. They've been around longer. Those programs. But what do they do in that time? What do they do at that seventy-year head start on Florida State? That's the whole thing against Florida fans, like Gator fans, talking about, oh, look at the all-time series. It's like, man, you guys were around decades. You had decades head start, and you have nothing to show for it. You have the same stuff that we do. Your little brother, quote unquote, idiots. Hey, woo, ooh. That's what I Easy. said. Dog, the dog days of August. All right, what do you did one. you have something to say about the ESPN thing? Or yeah, the so uh, from dogs they did an, they did another list just from post 1983. 18 that's when the TV money really started is how the guy explained why why he broke it down from 1983. In the top 5 since 1983, top 5 programs in the country using whatever metrics they were using for this mm-hmm. was Alabama 5, Miami 4, Ohio State 3, Ugh. Florida 2, and Florida State 1. Woo. So, we did it, gang. We did it, but I mean that's that's fair. You know what oh, I mean. I, I don't understand Tennessee. I don't. I, maybe I, I guess I don't know enough about their history. Maybe uh, Neyland or whoever it was was a a wonderful leader of white football players, um, <laughs> and we should show the proper respect. But I I just don't care. I don't care. I don't care about New Rockney. I know he was good, great for the game, and I apparently that was a good movie. Um, Ronald Reagan was in it. But yeah, don't care. Don't care about you coaching white football players against other white football players and excluding a, a huge section of the population of this country. And I just so I don't get I don't get worked up by it. Same thing with you, Cy Young, with your 511 wins. Who cares, buddy? Who cares? You weren't having to pitch to Ronald Acuna. I can promise you that. Baseball, you can't even compare it anymore. I mean, it's it's incredible. Um, I don't have a good segue to go to this, but you did a you, you wrote a really good story on Dante Lucas. And, Thanks, buddy. Um, you know, I think part of it, the, the crux of it, is the fact that this is talking season. We just talked about lists for twenty minutes. Sorry, I just moved and my audio went all weird. We just spent twenty minutes talking about lists because it's talking season, and a lot of players are talking and complimenting Dante Lucas. And I don't know how much of it, again, is a relative thing because he's a true freshman, but I think your point in your story is that it, it's time to take notice. One of the, the cool things about being a fan probably, and, and the reason you subscribe to War Chant to get the insight from Ira and Corey and Gene and Michael, maybe to a lesser extent myself, is that you want to know kind of what's going on before things start. I just always think about how much more fun would have 2013 been for me if I would have known what was about to happen. But then maybe part of it was fun because it was a surprise. But I kind of would have liked to know that Jameis Winston really was going to be this badass, transcendent talent. That would have been really cool. But it's time to get on board with with looking at Dante Lucas. 55 is going to have an impact sooner than later with this program, it seems like, in your opinion, Corey. I do. And I in you know, the the crux of the story, what the the purpose of the story was I you know, I didn't I didn't bring it up in the column, but I I brought it up to you and on the show before about um, the impact that Jalen Ramsey had uh, specifically for that one season in 2015 with a bunch of young guys, you know, Darby and PJ Williams had left and a bunch of young guys were fighting for their, for their spots, fight, trying to fight for a uh, play in time in the secondary. And they see that they see the best cornerback in the country work that hard and play that violently. And that mean, and I think it permeated the entire secondary and, and in a sense, the entire defense, I think they took their lead from that. And I think I'm not comparing him to Jalen Ramsey because he hasn't played a single down of college football and Jalen Ramsey might be wearing a gold jacket in 20 years. So I'm not comparing him to that, but I'm saying his impact, his mentality to, I mean, I don't know. You need mean guys, man. You just need, now you don't want a whole line of Richie incognitos, just wild, crazy bears that you can't take to a bar with you because they might uh, start just punching folks. And I'm not, I don't know that Dante Lucas would do anything like that. I, he's, he seems like a perfectly cool kid off the field, but on the field, he's a mean dude. He's nasty. And you want that because Florida state hasn't been that for forever. And all those guys, every time, every, I I think it was four guys I'd end up talking to. I didn't quote the other one. They all, the first thing they said about him was he's a dog and not a bad dog, a good dog. Like he's just, he's he's built differently. He's a good boy. He's not a, He's not a show dog. He's a hunting dog. Yes, yes. He's so he's he's wired differently, man. And he he wants to embarrass you. He wants to do the Michael Orr where he picks you up and takes you to the bus. Like he just wants to shut you up and pin you and embarrass you. That's what he wants. And Florida State needs that on the offensive line, man. They need a complete makeover. And you start with guys like this. 
Now, he's a true freshman, so how much is he going to play? I don't know. I know he hadn't been running with the ones lately, um, but he did he did work himself into the the first team like the third day of practice. So obviously the talent's there, and they believe in him, and I do think he's going to play. I don't know how much he's going to start, but just a true freshman that's already taken over kind of the meeting room. He's, he's taken over a, a leadership role to an extent, and he's somebody that they all look at. Even Ryan Roberts, who's uh, like a grizzled veteran, um, will be running for Congress soon. I hope is talking to him, talking about him almost in awe. Like, yeah, that guy. I I got to work hard because I know he's going to work hard every day. And Keyshawn Helton talking about him in awe. Like, yeah, man, he tells you what he's going to do, and then he does it. Like that's that's how you know he's he's bad, bad in, as in good. Sorry, it's 1983. <laughs> I have to exp- <laughs> have to explain these terms. Um, he's fat. He's fat. He's pretty yeah. hot and temp- pretty hot and tempting. Um. So, yeah, man, I, I just think that has an effect on the entire offensive line. Now, they've got to get better. They've got to get stronger. They've got to get deeper. All that stuff, I get it. But this one guy could be a guy, could be like uh, the anchor of a line that gets better. And if they follow his lead and all of a sudden you got a bunch of mean, nasty dudes that want to pin their guy because they see 55 doing it, then, okay, that's a good thing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right, Corey. I'm done with you. You done with me over here? I am done. You got uh I know, you know, for you know, people understand we sometimes record these in uh, different parts of the day. Are you going to uh, what are you what are you doing in uh Bradenton? How are you going to what are you doing in the nightlife? Uh, how are you going to how are you going to pass the hours? I don't know yet. Maybe I'll go check out Siesta Key. See, maybe I'll go check out the sunset at Siesta Key, you know, just by myself, get a Miami Vice, just kind of A little Tinder Tuesday? What we'll about a little Tinder place. Tuesday? I'm firing it up. We're doing a little swipe life right now. We're seeing what's out there. I'm t- again, it's just it's <laughs> such a cruel world, man, because I come to these towns and I match with, and again, it's just matching with them. And, you know, they still got to message you on Bumble and they do mostly, but it's just messaging. It doesn't mean necessarily that, you know, they think you're the best thing ever, but I come to these towns and I match with these absolutely gorgeous women. And then I come back to Tallahassee and I'm just Steve Buscemi. I just can't, I can't even, I can't do anything with a fistful of fifties. I can't even get anybody's attention. I think Buscemi does. All right. Probably. I don't know. Anyhow. Actor, famous actor. He also was a fireman before he became an actor, so he's got that hero element, too. I did not know that. I think he does all right. Okay. Well, folks, check out Warchant.com. Uh, Ira's got a nice little wrap-up of practice, maybe in a more palatable, optimistic tone than what you heard in the first eight minutes or so of this program. Uh, we will be back at practice on Wednesday. More video will be posted. Corey and I will be back with a podcast for you folks on Thursday. We might do Renegade Express Thursday, or we might push it to Friday, but do leave your questions over on the Tribal Council on Warchant.com. Use the promo code Warchant30. Actually, I think if you use the promo code Adidas, I think you still can get 25% off an annual membership and a $75 e-card to Adidas.com. And um, who doesn't want free stuff? So check that out. Go to Warchant.com for more details on that. Corey, thanks for hanging out. Thanks hey, thank here. you, buddy. I appreciate it. You. Just thank you for being you, Corey. I don't know what I would do without you. You'd be a lot sadder. We'll be back tomorrow. Have a great one, everybody. Unlike fanny packs, bowl cuts, and troll dolls, the sensation is back. Only at Zaxby's. The sensation salad and the new sensation filet sandwich features hand-breaded chicken, Asian slaw, wonton strips, and citrus vinaigrette. And both are served with an egg roll. The sensation salad and the new sensation filet sandwich meal. For a limited time, only at Zaxby's. And skip the line when you order ahead on the Zaxby's app or on Zaxby's.com.